Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Virginia SBDC's webinar series, Google and Beyond, Marketing and Managing on the Web. This series is designed to take a look at tools and techniques to help small businesses take their business to the next level. Today's webinar is Creation, Collaboration, Sharing, and Storage in the Cloud. All of our Google and Beyond webinars are presented by Ray Sidney Smith of W3 Consulting, a web and mobile strategy and training consultancy firm for small businesses. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type those questions into the question window and Ray will do his best to answer them. Without further ado, here's Ray Sidney Smith. Thank you, Tracy, and thank you to the Virginia SBDC Network for having me here on the webinars for Google and Beyond Marketing and Managing on the Web. Today we'll be talking about creation, collaboration, sharing, and storage in the cloud. It's a really big topic and it's a lot of fun. And uh, so I'm going to hope that we have a great time uh, together this morning. So if my slides work with me here, we'll, we'll go on to the next slide. And we're going to talk about uh, Twitter for a moment. Uh, if you have any questions or anything like that that happens after the, the webinar, you feel free to tweet at me while we're, while we're talking. At W3 Consulting, you can go, go ahead and hashtag that beyond Google. But again, as Tracy said, go ahead and feel free to ask questions in the question panel. And Tracy will... Uh, interrupt me and I'll be happy to answer any questions as we make our way through. So ask questions before, I'll leave a little time for questions at the end. What we're going to cover today is going to be, uh, you know, what is the cloud? We're going to define the cloud. It's a pretty simple definition, but some interesting pieces as it relates to small business. We're going to talk about why it's beneficial to small business. I think there are some really great benefits for small business embracing the cloud. There's sort of a, a catch-22 here, though, uh, Joseph Heller uh, referenced there, but the, uh, the catch-22 is that you have no choice but to embrace the, cl the cloud at this point in uh, small business, but at the same time, it really does benefit you. So it, is, you know, it behooves you to embrace the, the cloud, even though we're sort of being forced into it over, over the next couple of quarters and certainly over the next several years. We're going to talk about creation, collaboration, sharing, and storage tools. I'm going to go over sort of my favorite tools for small business, and I think that you'll like them as well once you've gone ahead and invested in them. And then I'm going to talk about some guidelines. I think there's some really important aspects of cloud storage and really cloud services in general for small business that we should pay attention to. So let's get started with this lovely table that Seagate.com provided me through a Gartner webinar, and it shows us that over the last... 10 years uh, and leading into 2015, you can see that we've had uh, clouds, uh, we've had client storage space, and this hard drive devices uh, showing storage. You, you can see in 2000 we had uh, you know uh, x amount of, of thousands of devices holding these amount you know storage. This in this case, uh, client PCs. We then uh, fast forward to 2015, and you can see that we have media tablets, smartphones taking over the majority of hard drive space, this is storage space, and then client PCs coming in at second in terms of the amount of space that we are starting to take over. So hard drive space, space in general, is becoming its own commodity. And what we have to realize is that the more we want to use smartphones, you can see the diagram clearly shows us that we're going to want to use smartphones more and more the uh, more importance of offloading that storage somewhere other than phones. Phones are tiny devices, and no matter how much storage we can pack into them, it creates a whole host of new problems. The whole host of new problems is that it increases the amount of battery usage, which means the batteries have to become stronger, and they're not keeping pace, actually, with the uh, pace of the technology of, of, of storage. You know, we want more and more space but the, but the amount of space that we need requires more computing power, which drains batteries. And the batteries are not keeping up with, our, with, our, with the pace of technology. So we have that problem. The other side is that uh, the more space we need on, on devices really equates to the heavier and larger some of these products are becoming. And for most of us, we want a small device. That seems to be the current trend, is to have a smaller uh, uh, phone and sort of a larger tablet. But in, in line with that, that creates a disparity of where is my data? My data might be on my, on my phone. It may be on my media tablet, my mobile device, on my computer. Where, where does my data really live? And that becomes a problem in and of itself. So we, we, we come into all of these different problems. And this is where the cloud was really 
really developed was out of this desire to really help bring together all of those pieces, those disparate devices, into one space. So what is the cloud? It's a question I get very, very frequently, and I can tell you that the answer is not this. So <laughs> most people say, what's the cloud? Is Google the cloud? And while uh, Google actually uh, you know, sort of has pioneered the area of cloud services, Google is not the cloud. Google is a search engine. You can actually think of uh, search as a surface, serves as a service, I'm sorry. Uh, search as a service itself is a kind of cloud service. We're getting internet uh, search engine you know, uh, you know, uh, services through Google on the internet. But in essence, Google is not the cloud. The cloud is much more pervasive. So what is the cloud? Uh, this is really the cloud. If you think about it, the cloud is a bunch of servers uh, you know, but what we call server farms. There are tons and tons of computers, infrastructure, sitting behind the scenes that you never see. And you never have to interact with them. You never have to really work to maintain them or anything else like that. So uh, this is really the cloud. The cloud is the huge amount of architecture, information uh, infrastructure behind the scenes there to support you without you ever having to see it. Okay. So while the cloud may look like this, in, in essence, the cloud is really just a set of internet-based hardware and software. Okay? Very simple. It's web-based hardware and software. Now, it usually comes in several different forms. Okay? And the most common form you're going to see is what we call software as a service, or SaaS. Okay? Uh, so you can become sassy with, by using some software as a service. Uh, but software as a service is the primary means in which small businesses really go ahead and access the cloud. Okay? You're going to see it in other ways. Hardware as a service, some people will uh, go ahead and have uh, what are called appliance devices that go ahead and access the cloud and do some, some things that way. Uh, also, uh, there is the desktop as a service where uh, most people may have uh, had a had sort of interaction with the Citrix desktop concept, you know, where you would have basically a login to a screen, and that would take you to your desktop in the cloud, as opposed to logging into your computer locally. Uh, for most small businesses, that's not going to be really pretty much an issue. And then finally, platform as a service. This is really for for developers. It creates an environment for you to go ahead and, uh, you know, uh, code or, or you know, write in your particular uh, language. Uh, you know, uh, web scripting language or, or native scripting language to be able to, de to develop for your clients in that particular realm. But really, for the most part, you're going to decide, I need this particular service, and, I, and I, instead of downloading software to your computer, you're going to go to your web browser, and you're going to use what's called software as a service. You're going to use SaaS, okay? So this comes from, this goes to QuickBooks Online, uh, to Salesforce.com, to all sorts of other products where you just go, you go to a website, username, login, and you pay a fee or don't pay a fee for many of them, and you use those services. Okay. okay? Uh, finally, cloud is all about the devices being merely access points to the cloud. The cloud is your, is your data. It's where your data sits, it's where your data lives, and it's where a lot of the processing of what's happening behind the scenes is taking place. So your devices are, are, are almost throwaway. You know, they're, they're, uh, I always say this about Google specifically because of Google Apps uh, you know, and, and the heavy work I do with, with uh, Google products. But you know, I could take my phone and uh, throw it out the window, uh, you know, walk down to a store, you know, a, tele, uh, you know, a mobile uh, store you know, like AT&T or Verizon or T-Mobile or whatnot. I could buy a new phone, plug in, you know, download my Google Apps, log into my account, and everything that was available before automatically comes back into, into play. I didn't, I didn't lose a beat when I, when I switched phones. That's the kind and the level of, of power that you really want to access and use with the cloud. So just to recap, the cloud is really just the internet hardware and software that you're accessing through typically SaaS, which is software as a service. Okay, and you want to start thinking about your devices, your computers, your client PCs, your Macs, your 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 uh, laptops and mobile devices, whether they be smartphones 
or your uh, or your tablet devices. Those are all merely access points to your cloud services. Sometimes through web browsers, sometimes through smartphone applications and uh, tablet applications. Okay, so that's what we're really really dealing with when we talk about the cloud. If you have any questions about this, feel free to ask. I will be more than happy to answer any specific questions you have about confusion regarding what the cloud really means. So with that as our basis, what can cloud do for you? I sort of like the joke there. Uh, well, what can cloud do for you? First, it can go ahead and streamline costs and reduce upfront investments in information technology and your, what we call IT infrastructure. So as a small business, instead of going out there and buying lots and lots of software, what happens is the cloud allows you to be able to pay a small fee per usually user or for the amount of space that you're using, and you can go ahead and start now, today, through your web browser with whatever service you need. So if you need online backup, if you need to be able to collaborate and create documents in the cloud, if you need to be able to uh, run your accounting software, if you need to do a webinar, all of that is available right directly in the cloud. There's no upfront capital of having to buy a server. You, have to buy, you don't have to buy a, uh, a set of, of, of equipment and all these other things. It's all built into the service that you're paying for for a nominal fee. So again, let's talk about the software as a service concept. Software as a service means that you're just going to pay usually a monthly or annual fee. And that's going to be like I said, per user or usually per amount of stores that you're, you're accessing or that you have access to. And now that small fee is paid or that annual fee is paid and, and that is it. There's no, there's no other anything. That's, that's what you're paying for the service. So it's, it's actually really great for you to be able to budget. As a small business, it gives you the opportunity to be able to streamline those costs from, from you know, having to have had infrastructure you can, you can take that infrastructure away, you can sell it, whatever it might be, and now you can just use that, that IT stuff in the cloud. Next, it reduces headaches. I, I really find that the headache factor is one of the main reasons why small businesses should really take over this. You have a business to run. You shouldn't have to become your own IT department uh, in, in terms of spending hours and hours and hours maintaining all of these things. You know, in, in a prior life, in a business that I ran, I had to manage many, many computers, and that meant running, you know, several servers, and every server, you know, had a different uh, configuration. Some of the servers would go down. We had several fax servers, and these fax servers were churning out hundreds of documents uh, inbound and outbound a day, and there was just huge amounts of maintenance and headaches. I had to change every user password. Uh, you know, user login and password. If somebody got themselves locked out or if somebody deleted something, I had to log into the server to do it. It was a nightmare as a business owner. And, you know, we, we had uh, an IT staff of me, an IT staff of one. And so it really required, uh, you know, way too much maintenance. Uh, when something needed to be upgraded, guess who had to do it? You know, in the, in the cloud world, all of those go away. There's no maintenance involved. You, you set up a username and password for yourself. You set up a username and password for your staff. And pretty much that's it. If they lock themselves out, there's a forgot your password link most likely on the service. They click on that link and they go ahead and get themselves uh, a new password sent to them through, through the service directly. They manage really the account themselves. All you have to do is really do that initial setup. So it's really, really simple in that regard. There's no manual upgrades typically within a cloud service. You pretty much have the service when they scale out new new services or new features within the service. It's done. You log in and now you're ready to use that service out the gate. So you don't really have that concept of the manual upgrade anymore. There's no server sitting in your in your office or in your in your uh, facility for you to have to go ahead and maintain in that regard. Uh, that's a huge cost savings, both potentially a rental cost savings as well as the power and the internet bandwidth connection and all of those other things that you might have to have had as infrastructure behind when you were doing it yourself. SaaS handles its own backups typically. Not that I don't recommend you having a backup of your own, but it's helpful to have that first line of defense as it relates to backup. So think about SaaS as having its own backup as a primary defense, 
and then you having a secondary defense in the background having and running on backup. And then finally, security is provided usually by the provider. So in, in most cases, if you are logging into a system, they're going to handle all of the security. You know, they're, they're monitoring their system. And they don't just have you at stake as the individual client. They have many clients where they have to make sure that they have, they have the, the um, you know, not just consumer, but business and enterprise level security. And some of them have government level security as it relates to accessing that particular portal, which is great for you. It gives you great security in knowing that you don't have to have your data compromised very easily out there on the web, which would probably happen if you tried to run your own cloud service necessarily. Finally, access to your cloud services are from anywhere. You and your staff can go ahead and access those from your mobile devices, from your laptops and uh, your client PCs in your office. But if you're out there on the road and if you want to meet with clients face to face, you can have access to those, those cloud services wherever you might be as long as you have connection to the web. So just remember that access to your cloud services from anywhere, which means that you know you could be sitting on the beach in Tahiti and having a great time, and also uh, in, enjoying uh, access to knowing what's going on in your business and being able to run the business without having to run back and forth potentially to the office just to access a piece of data or just to be able to you know check a box in an application to make those things happen. You can really do those things from anywhere. Okay. So the cloud has a lot of really amazing benefits, benefits you don't even realize until you start using them, and then they, they become normative. And you're like, oh, yeah, of course, you know, every, everything should be as easy as this. But when you haven't yet accessed the cloud, you really see the difference. Uh, you know, if you happen to be on travel and need to be able to access something to make a deal happen, to make that sale, to make that next, uh, you know, dollar come in the door, if you need to get that thing done to get a client to, to uh, you know, have what they need so that you can get paid, those things can happen through the cloud that it couldn't happen before when you were in an analog world or non-cloud world. Okay? So it's really important to think about that. All right. So, uh, Tracy, any questions uh, yet? Yeah, Ray, we had one. Where can we find an affordable cloud-based ER, ERP application? way beyond the scope of today. Yeah. So if you want to touch base with me uh, after the webinar off, offline, I'll be more than happy to uh, discuss all sorts of ERP, but it's, it, it is, that, that's definitely beyond the purview of today, okay? And so uh, let's, let's get into any, of, any other questions then, Tracy? No. Great, so we're going we're gonna to talk about uh, some, some creation, collaboration, sharing, and storage tools. I lump them all together into sort of a a running list of the ones that I really enjoy using and so I'm going to jump right into them and if you have questions about individual products or other products that you might know about feel free to uh, you know go ahead and let Tracy know and I'll be happy to, uh, to answer any questions that you might have about specific ones that you might be using or not using. First up though is Google Drive. So while I said that Google at the beginning Google is not the cloud Google, though, has been a huge pioneer and is probably one of the most amazing parts of the cloud today. So Google has this product called Google Drive. If you haven't heard me talk about it before, here I go. So Google Drive is a fantastic product on a whole host of levels, but first really on the creation level. Google allows you to use this product, Google Docs. Uh, you know, it's, it's gone through several names, but let's get Google Docs, Google Documents, whatever. But inside Google Drive, which you access by going to drive.google.com, and if you have a Google Apps for Business account, you would log into that by going to your google.com forward slash a forward slash domain name, you know, your business name.com, and you'll go ahead and be able to uh, log into your Drive account. And from within Google Drive, you can actually create documents right there live in your web browser. So if you haven't seen this before, it's really phenomenal. As the little screen capture on the right-hand side of the screen right now shows, you are looking at a, at, at a, at a screenshot of a, of a web document. This is similar to a Microsoft Word document that you would normally have downloaded on, on your computer. You know, you have Microsoft Word downloaded on your computer. You would open up the software on your computer. You'd have to pay Microsoft for a license for every computer that you had. And, uh, you know, at, 
at several hundred dollars a license, that becomes pretty expensive. Google Drive has helped to reduce that. If you use the personal on the consumer side, it's free, and they give you a lot of amount of space. On the on the business side, it's five dollars per user per month, or fifty dollars per year. The fifty dollars per year is a pretty good discount, right? It brings it down to four dollars and something cents a month. And so you have uh, five dollars per year, or fifty dollars. I'm sorry, fifty dollars per year, or five dollars per user per month, and you get access to not just what would be the equivalent to Microsoft Word, but you get the access to the uh, spreadsheet document, which would be the equivalent of Excel. You get the equivalent of the uh, PowerPoint tool called presen uh, presentations. Uh, you know, you get a, you get you get a whole host of other tools built into Google Drive, plus all the storage and sharing access and all that other fun stuff that I'll talk about shortly. So, the creation component within the cloud is really going to be where we are going in the next couple of years. So right now it's all about the storing and the sharing and being able to get things to and from people very quickly and easily. But soon it's going to be the ability to go in and I know Google has done it already so well, but we're going to see more and more of this. Adobe has been working to do this as well and Adobe has their Adobe Cloud Connect products now, uh, which allows you to, be able to create very advanced documents and so on and so forth. Uh, you know, uh, layout documents, video editing, all that stuff within a cloud environment. So, really think about how you're how you're how you're taking things off the desktop and now applying them within the web browser. How are you going to do something in a web browser now, just like you would normally do with a desktop a piece of software? That's what that's what's being created in front of you right now. So you're capable of doing all these really wonderful things with Google Drive. Uh, this is a screenshot of me actually doing this on my own phone. So I thought, well, you know, this would be great to create a document just for me to go ahead and, and uh, do. I can do that live on my phone, uh, you know, on my smartphone, walking down the street. I can go ahead and uh, click on the little button in, in, uh, in Google Drive. I go ahead and give it a name. And then there we go. I'm creating this document on my phone. I can type live. I can create, change fonts, bold, italicize, do all the things that I would normally do in a basic word uh, processing document. And uh, and there I go. So it's a it's a really really powerful tool. And then when I'm done with the document, here I have the documents uh, uh, you know, options open. You can see I can share the document down here. I can go ahead and delete the document. I can move it to different folders. I can print it to a particular printer in my office. Uh, I can go ahead and rename it. I can share it. I can give get a link for it and put that in an email. It gives me a whole host of tools right within the sharing platform. So Google Drive, amazing, really, really great product, and definitely if you're if you're trying to create documents in the cloud, uh, this is really the go-to product right now. And uh, and I'll talk a little bit about other products that do that down the road as I get to them. But this is really the the um, the, the, the gold standard. Uh, Google Drive also gives you the ability to go ahead and share those documents with other people. So really think about it from the potential to collaborate, not just with your staff, but with your vendors and, and industry partners, as well as with your clients. If you need to engage your clients in a particular document, if you want to give a presentation like the one I'm giving right now, you know, this is a Google presentation it's sitting in the cloud. I could give you a link to it right now, and you could go right to it in your web browser and be able to follow along with the presentation live with me. Lots of really great things that you can do all through the Google Drive platform. And you can see that you can drag and drop photo images and video and whatever else you want into Google Drive, whatever kind of file format you want. And it's all there sitting for you, ready for you to be able to collaborate around. Next up is uh, Windows Live. And uh, Windows Live is uh, uh, Windows Microsoft's concept of being able to take their products and sort of push it into the cloud and to give you access to some of those things. They've done that by allowing you to access it primarily through Outlook.com or Live.com. If you log in, create a Microsoft account, and, uh, and now you have access to email in the cloud. So it's an email uh, service very similar to having Gmail or Hotmail or one of those other services, those free services in the cloud. And you can also then upgrade to have it be you know, your, your name at yourbusinessname.com. And now you have a, a, a mini Outlook sort of tool right there in the cloud. You can also 
get a full service Microsoft Outlook version in the cloud as well. It's a hosted version of Outlook where it looks almost exactly like Outlook and you can use that in the cloud as well. So that's that's a different product from the live account. But you know you have all of these various options and Windows Live gives you access to contacts in the cloud so that you can go ahead and uh, and have that uh, what do you call it um, synchronization with your contacts across multiple uh, places. You can have your calendar synchronized and then of course SkyDrive and SkyDrive is really we're still on sort of that creation mode and we're able to now create Microsoft Office documents, you know, Excel documents, PowerPoint presentations right there in the cloud within SkyDrive and we can go ahead and upload documents that uh, support that particular PowerPoint presentation. We can upload, uh, you know, photos that might be necessary for a particular Word document that we're putting together. So we can upload all of the, all of that data and, and, and all those files into our SkyDrive and have access to it from our email to be able to forward that along to folks right there in the cloud. Very, very seamless uh, tool uh, you know, for you to be able to go ahead and access those things. It even gives you a chat client within the, uh, within the tool, which Google Drive does and many other products do as well, but it gives you the chat functionality so that you can go ahead and do that. One really great thing about Windows or Microsoft in this particular um, area is that they've actually included Skype. So they've, ha they've, they've attempted to integrate Skype within the live.com account. So you can actually chat with uh, folks uh, in your Skype account while you're in your live.com interface. So if you have a lot of Skype contacts and you want to be able to collaborate with people that way, you can go ahead and have that live chat with uh, actually Skype, Facebook, and Google, I believe, you can do all within the, the live.com account. Okay. Next up is uh, Zoho. And Zoho is a fairly, I, I believe, unknown product, but it's been around a long time. And Zoho, if you go to Zoho.com, is a, a, a whole, it's a plethora of tools. I mean, there's so many tools that they have, it's a little bit uh, overwhelming, uh, similar to Google in that regard. Uh, but Zoho has these, uh, the same creation tools. You can, you, can, you can use Zoho Writer, and you can open up a document and collaborate with them. But they have everything from wikis to, uh, you know, wikis are, are open documents, so it's, a, it's an open platform. If you think about Wikipedia, anybody can go to Wikipedia, create an account, and update any Wikipedia article, any Wikipedia, you know, encyclopedia entry. And so it's very similar to that. Zoho has this tool for you to create your own internal wiki, what we call an enterprise wiki. So you can actually create a wiki for your own office. It's private for you and your staff. So you can invite just your staff into the wiki, and now you all can go ahead and make edit improve the wiki over time, maybe for an operations manual, maybe for particular areas of, of, of guides for working with, uh, with clients in, in, in one way or another. You can provide particular guides for your clients and give only them access to that, that wiki. You have a lot of options as it relates to Zoho, and uh, Zoho has a calendar and have the ability to create websites and all sorts of really great products and tools built Within, uh, within the functionality of, of Zoho itself. Uh, Zoho is uh, pretty cost effective as well. I mean, I, don't, I, I haven't seen the prices being outrageous, so that's always helpful. And, uh, you know, it gives you, it gives you uh, a pretty uh, broad-based set of services. So if you think about Zoho from a project management perspective, there's a project management tool within Zoho so that you can go ahead and manage your project projects within Zoho. So just think about it. It's a great product. I think that it's worthy of, of looking at for some specific businesses. So uh, next up is going to be one of my favorite products. It's uh, fairly new to the scene, and I have been uh, just gushing all about it for quite some time to everybody who will listen. And so since you're here, <laughs> you're going to listen. And so it's called Hajoki. And uh, it's actually a, a piece of software that is being built in, in Germany right now. The developers are in Germany, uh, is my understanding. And uh, so this is a little, just a little bit of layout of what happens when you log into Hajoki. So just on the very basis, Hajoki is an ability for you to collaborate. Collaborate on the most fundamental level with lots of cloud services. Okay? So think about it this way. 
say you have a, uh, a, a uh, Microsoft Live account, you also have a, a Dropbox account, which I'm going to talk about shortly. Say you have an Evernote account, you have a Twitter profile, you have your Facebook, you have your, just you name it, every kind of cloud service that you have, okay? Uh, your Google Calendar, your, your Google Drive, everything you have in terms of cloud services, you connect to Hajoki. And so in the background, Hajoki just starts to pay attention to what is happening in each one of those areas. And so it says, oh, it looks like you went and updated a Google contact recently. And look, you went ahead and added this Evernote note. And so-and-so went ahead and edited your document in Google Drive. And so-and-so uh, added this particular link and added a bookmark in this space. And slowly but surely, it starts to culminate and put together this activity feed, which is what you see in front of you right now. Now, as new activities happen, it notifies you of them in the stream. And so it's sort of like Facebook but Facebook for all of your cloud services pulled into one, so you don't miss anything. And so you can actually go across and look back a day, go, go forward and, and see what's, what's happening down in the, in the news feed, and you can really start to explore your data. But then it doesn't stop there. You're able to actually then go ahead and interact with that data with your team. So say you're, you uh, see that particular PowerPoint presentation and you say, oh, you know what, Sally needs to go ahead and make sure X or Y happens with it. Well, you could just go ahead and add a comment uh, to that particular doc document mentioning Sally, and Sally will now be notified that you've made a comment to that document, and you can make new tasks for people within the document, for staff and other people doing things. So live in the stream, you are capable of interacting and engaging and project managing all in the same space. Really, really powerful tool and you can get a daily email that tells you what's been happening so that you can interact with those things. And just generally, it's a fantastic tool, and I say go check it out. So, Pajoki. Next up is another one of my favorite tools. It's actually my project management tool of choice, and it's the one I use with W3 Consulting right now. And Asana is a project management tool, uh, and so, you know, uh, you, you would typically know the word asana from, from the yogic posture term, or, you know, with the concept of the um, asana, um, but they pronounce it asana, I think, and so I'm going to use the word asana. So asana looks sort of like this. You log into the tool, and it's, uh, it's free, actually, for up to, I think, 30, so if you have under 30 users, 30 members, I, I, I believe that it's actually free for you, so you create your awesome company profile, as it says here, and uh, then you go ahead and start to create projects, and you can create milestones. It's just a very seamless, integrated interface. What I really love about it being a cloud service is that it's all inside your browser. You can download the, the mobile apps, you know, there's smartphone apps for Android, iOS, and, you, uh, and it works really, really well, uh, but it also connects to your other cloud services. So say you have a document in Dropbox or a document in Google Drive, you can go ahead and attach them here within Asana. And what I also love is that it's very, it can be very email centric or it can be completely not email centric. So you can work completely in a dashboard here or you can just uh, set up Asana to go ahead and send you emails whenever there's interactions with things. So since I'm very email centric, I like to be able to get those email notices and reply to them, and Asana gives me that flexibility so that every person on staff can really choose the way in which they want to interact with the system. And you can email tasks and projects into the uh, platform. You can see more detail about everything, so you can see when you hover over a particular item, it'll have this little tiny arrow to the right of it. Hopefully you can see my, my cursor circling the little arrow. And you can just click on this particular arrow, it'll open it up and it'll give you the ability to create subtasks and have a conversation about that particular item and really engage with your staff without having to create a whole new volume of email. That's really not necessary. You can have that conversation right within the project management tool. So from a cloud services perspective, instead of having all of this other software that you would need, you can literally run your entire business within Asana using this project management. Uh, functionality. Really, really cool stuff. So, if anyone has any questions, 
so far, I'm happy to answer that. There's lots, lots of different products, lots of different things going on. All right. Next up is going to be one of my favorite tools as well, and really the tool that does the best at sharing right now. Uh, Dropbox itself is a, a cloud storage tool. So think about it from the perspective that it does cloud storage, and it is by itself just a piece of software that you install on your desktop, and you sign up for an account, they give you X amount of data for free, and you download it uh, to, your, to your computer. It's this little tiny piece of software, and what it does is it creates a new folder on your computer. And that folder, the Dropbox folder, you go ahead and you uh, put files into it. And you just keep putting files into it, and what it does is it saves those files up to your Dropbox account. And your Dropbox account lives on the web, and now say that you have a second computer. Well, you go to your second computer and you download and install this little Dropbox uh, software, and you log into your Dropbox account, the same Dropbox account, and now what happens is the same data, the same files that you had uploaded on the one computer now are on your Dropbox uh, folder on your second computer. And then you do that with the third computer. You go ahead and get a third computer. You uh, install your uh, software on there and you authenticate. You put in your login credentials to your Dropbox account. And all of a sudden your folder, uh, your folder, your Dropbox folder fills up with all the same files that you had on there. Well, now I go back to my first computer and I decide that I want to uh, add another file. Well, same thing will happen across the other two computers. Your other computers will go ahead and just download automatically those files as well. So they're available everywhere you might be. And so then you go ahead and decide, I'm going to go log into uh, you know, my phone and I want to find the file. So you download the Dropbox uh, application, you log into your Dropbox account in there, and voila, all the files that you have in your Dropbox folder on any of those computers are now available in your mobile phone so that you can email them, send them along to folks. What's really brilliant about Dropbox is that they create granular uh, sharing links. So I can go into any Dropbox file and with about three clicks I can create a link and then that link gives me the ability to just give it to anyone and they now have, a, have access to that particular file in my Dropbox account without compromising the security of any of the other files that are out there. So I've given uh, specific access to this one with this one link, which I can kill at any time, and uh, you know, and it gives me the ability to go ahead and share just quickly and easily lots of different types of files. So there are lots of different kinds of Dropbox competitors out there, but for the most part, Dropbox really does a great job of being able to do it. And once you go into the team world where you're allowed to use uh, Dropbox in a business environment, you can do that on a, on, on a much more robust level. And Dropbox gives you all sorts of, of data and ability to be able to use Dropbox in a much more flexible fashion. So uh, Dropbox is great. It gives you uh, a fantastic ability to uh, go into the web interface and interact and, and, and uh, move files around and give access and folders. So I can give one folder access, I'll call it you know, W3 Consulting. That W3 Consulting folder will now have access to, uh, I can give access to all of my other staff members' Dropbox accounts. And now they have access to just that folder in my own Dropbox account. So uh, you could have a clients folder, and within the clients folder, give access to only those specific a specific folder to a specific client so that you can have a staff folder where the staff have access to the, that data and the clients folder and then the clients can only have access to the Dropbox folders that you've given them. So you can uh, really create a great level of, of granular security and giving people the appropriate access rights for for what they need to interact with you so you don't have to you know you don't have to email them huge uh, files anymore. You can literally put a, a Dropbox file into Dropbox, and then it'll be in the folder. And you can email them and say, hey, I just placed this folder in Dropbox. You can now go ahead and download it from there. And now the client doesn't have to wait X number of hours for you know a large file to upload or download. It just shows up in Dropbox. It goes ahead and synchronizes. And now they'll have access to it there on the computer. So really, really great tool. 
and, uh, and, and I think a lot of people probably already know about it, but don't know about some of its other uh, little, little tweaks and hints and, and tricks. One thing that you should really pay attention to right now with regard to any of these services is that the synchronization is automated. So in this particular way, Dropbox gives you the ability to uh, delete something. So if I give you access to my Dropbox, I also give you access to delete things, which is sometimes a problem. Uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was sitting at my computer and I noticed that all of a sudden my Dropbox icon started to synchronize, which usually means that a staff member or a client has started to put something into my Dropbox and uh, it's downloaded which is great. So I went to look at it. It you know, distracted me for a moment. And I went up and looked at the box. And it started to show things being deleted. And it wasn't just one file being deleted, which would make sense. You know, somebody just made a mistake. They made something. They wanted to delete it. No, no, no. It was hundreds of files all of a sudden being deleted. And so I knew there was a real problem. So I immediately right-clicked on the Dropbox icon and paused the synchronization function on the tool. And then I ran to my other computer and caused the synchronization on that as well. And so uh, then I you know, logged into my Dropbox account. And what I saw was somebody had accidentally, uh, you know, in, in on my own staff, had accidentally uh, deleted that Dropbox folder. Uh, you know, and so it started to delete all of, all of our client files, all of our form files, everything in the, in the company's directory. And, uh, and, you know, uh, of course, you know, there was, uh, you know, shock and dismay on my face, uh, you know, and I have backups of backups, so it's not that, that big of a deal. But uh, one functionality within Dropbox that you have to remember, uh, one, one quirk is that it, everybody has access rights to it. But the other side to that is Dropbox has a feature called the Pack Rat feature. And the Pack Rat feature allows you to be able to log into, into Dropbox and to see files that have been recently deleted. You have, I think, 30 days to see any files that have been recently deleted. And you can go ahead and just, uh, you know, multiple, multiple select, you know, uh, multi-select all the files that have been deleted by accident and just go ahead and restore those files back to the Dropbox. So remember that even if you do delete something from Dropbox, you do have 30 days to go ahead and, and pull them back in. And of course, uh, you know, uh, train your staff uh, to make sure that they don't make accidental deletions like what happened in this particular case. So just, just make sure that you're, you're paying attention to all of those things. Uh, accidental delet deletions happen, and in this particular case, it uh, probably couldn't have been avoided considering this particular person's uh, you know, setup. It just, it just uh, was an accidental deletion. Uh, we fixed it, but pay attention to that, because if you don't have all the backups of, of, these, of these files somewhere, uh, it could potentially cause a, a huge problem for you. If all those files were lost, for instance, if I didn't have backups and didn't have a back, the pack rat feature within Dropbox, I would have been in, I would have been in a lot of uh, pain that day, uh, you know, because I would have lost a lot of really vital files for my company. So remember the Dropbox uh, pack rat feature and uh, pay attention to uh, who has access rights to those things. Uh, remember also that you can remove people from. Uh, having access to things, so you can, uh, if you can give, you can take. So if you've given people access rights, you can go ahead and take those away as well, so that you can, uh, you can go ahead in there and do that. And Dropbox also gives you a view to show who you're sharing what with, so you can go through and see what you're sharing, what you're not sharing, and uh, take control of the information uh, administrative rights. Okay. Moving right along to uh, my next favorite product, which is Evernote. Evernote, which you can find at evernote.com is a kind of creation, collaboration, sharing, and storage tool all wrapped into one. So very similar to some of the other products I talked about, Dropbox lacks uh, in a creation function, for instance. So Dropbox doesn't have the ability for you to create anything within it. Google Drive does, and, and Soho does, and so on and so forth. Uh, Microsoft Live, uh, the, the SkyDrive does. Uh, but, but here, Evernote also gives you the function to be able to create what are called notes. So you can create notes. You can capture photos directly from within uh, Evernote. Uh, you can record audio within Evernote. And so it comes as a web application, which is in the cloud. You can download an application to your computers, your Mac or PC. You can download them to your smartphones or your mobile devices as well, your tablets. So you have all of these abilities for Evernote to be with you anywhere, anytime. And you go ahead in and you just decide that you want to capture information. You can drag almost any kind of file into Evernote, although Evernote can only open up certain kinds of files. 
So if you drag the PDF into Evernote, it would save it into Evernote and be accessible, you know, like a cloud server should be. It's accessible anywhere you have access to your Evernote account. And you'll be able to open up that PDF and read it, right? They're live inside Evernote. Uh, if you opened up some kind of fancy graphic design, uh, you know, file, it wouldn't be able to open that. It would tell you, this is the file, it's sitting in here, but you need to download it and open it up in another piece of software to be able to really manipulate it. So uh, you can create to-dos and you can create reminders on those to-dos. So you can set a date and time and have it alert for you to things. You can take pictures of uh, business cards and save business cards in there. There are hundreds, if not thousands now, of ways in which you can use Evernote. And those are all available on Evernote.com. Evernote has uh, a whole uh, blog series dedicated to ways in which people are using Evernote. And you would be absolutely surprised at the, at the ingenuity and the different ways in which people use Evernote, from shopping lists to running their entire business using Evernote. Evernote has a product called Evernote for Business. And Evernote for Business is uh, basically a, a, a more than premium level uh, service that allows you to be able to give access to staff and has lots more space than the normal Evernote account and so on and so forth. I actually still only use an Evernote premium account and that more than satisfies all of my personal and professional uh, needs uh, as it relates to Evernote. But I can't speak more highly of Evernote. It's my primary place for putting notes for things because it just allows me to be able to just quickly and easily put things into that. I will note that Google has a competing product called Google Keep. Google Keep, if you're within Google Drive, which is drive.google.com, just put a forward slash keep, K-E-E-P, and you'll be taken to Google Keep. Google Keep is actually baked into the Android platform now, and it's also a fantastic product. Uh, I haven't really adopted it yet as my primary tool because I've just used Evernote for so long, but have had, had I not had Evernote, Google Keep is amazing. You can actually uh, talk to Google Keep from your mobile phone or, or tablet, and it will just automatically create tasks and remember things for you and remind you about them later. So really, really cool tool. Anyway, Evernote.com, fantastic product, really cool ability for you to be able to go in and uh, save documents, uh, save items, and then share them easily and quickly with staff, vendors, clients, all of those things. So really think about it. It's, it's, a, fantastic, it's a fantastic product and uh, a really uh, a great tool for being able to manage information as well. So if you have a FAQ, you can publish the FAQ through Evernote. There's actually a product called Pistachio that allows you to be able to use Evernote as a blog. So you can actually use Evernote and just every note that you create creates a new blog in, in, your, in your blog on the web. You have lots of really amazing ways in which Evernote can be used to manage Product producing websites. However, as you can see from the screenshot of my uh, smartphone uh, a couple days ago, there are lots of, 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 uh, of cloud storage solutions out there today. Uh, you know, there's SugarSync and uh, many of the other products that I use on a daily basis. You can see the six that I use on a regular basis. SugarSync, Google Drive, Dropbox, SkyDrive, Box, and Cloud Drive, which is an Amazon product. But as you can see here, you have a lot of options for very specific storage solutions. So Cloud Drive and My Shoebox are dedicated to photos. Uh, Dropbox can automatically back up from your phone all of the photographs that you have on here. I would recommend to everyone to think about uh, you know, doing that as opposed to actually using the Apple iCloud functionality if you have an iOS device. So while I have nothing against Apple, iCloud itself is not a true backup solution within iCloud. So if you are not synchronizing through iTunes to backup your photos into iPhotos from your iOS device, you are actually putting your, your photos in iCloud, but iCloud itself only saves a certain number. I think it's 500 photos. After that 500 photos, well, 501 from you know maybe a couple of months ago to maybe several years ago when you took them, uh, it goes away. It disappears. So unless they've changed that and someone can correct me, iCloud is not a true backup solution and it's very, very scary because I think a lot of people enable iCloud thinking that it's saving their, their files, their pictures, and it's really not. So uh, the other side to this is that think about cloud storage from not just the perspective of 
your, your typical uh, data files. But think about YouTube. YouTube is, a, is an immense storage uh, uh, tool for video. If you, if you uh, have a lot of video, YouTube has the ability for you to save that video in, uh, in the cloud, uh, edit and manipulate it in the cloud, and uh, primarily uh, it's free. You, know, you can just upload as much as you want and put it up there. Uh, you can make it private so that it's not actually accessible to anyone else. Uh, Google Plus has given you a great ability to do this, and uh, Google Plus now allows you to upload the photo albums. Yahoo's Flickr gives you now a terabyte of, of, of space. I mean, we're not just talking about, you know, once upon a time, you know, I had a, I had a megabyte floppy disk, <laughs> and that held all the data for myself in my entire life, you know, and now, you know, I have a, a, a smartphone that has uh, 24,000 times the amount of data than my, my original floppy disk, and now uh, we have uh, Flickr, a web storage, a, a cloud storage service for photographs that gives me a terabyte, not a, not a megabyte, not a, a gigabyte, but a terabyte, 1,000 gigabytes worth of file storage space in there in the cloud. So you have a lot of storage space available to you, a lot of it for free. That comes with some caveats, but the, for the most part, you have a lot of, uh, of options available to you. Make sure that you look at the various options and see which ones might fit specific types of files. Okay, So if you're trying to save for photos, then make sure that those photos are, are uploading them and uploading them in the format you want them to be uploaded. So you know, many times uh, these storage services will upload them to a particular kind of file format, which will change your file format. You know, this happened with Facebook many years ago. People were like, oh, I'll just upload all of my photos to Facebook and read it forever. Well, the problem is, is that well, when you upload them to Facebook and read it forever, that also means that they are in Facebook's format in Facebook's. Uh, sort of dumbed down, smaller file size with crazy names. So if you were to ever re-download those files, they lack a lot of the things that you thought they had. Uh, so just make sure you're aware of what it's doing as it changes the files and moves them up to services and down. Obviously, the ones that you're going to that are going to be much more uh, business savvy are going to be aware of that and are going to keep uh, things in their native format. The ones that are more consumer-based products, which many small businesses use anyway. Will uh, again be uh, will be the ones to probably change your file format, and you should be paying attention to those. Uh, but check out Glide, check out Copy. Those are also good good tools. My Shoebox has an unlimited uh, photo thing that's going on, so you can go ahead and upload unlimited photos to them. But try them all. Try some of them. Try one of them. Just dip your foot in the water and see what you like about those particular cloud products. Uh, we have our own. Uh, cloud storage uh, for uh, online backup, and so if you don't have a backup solution, uh, just make sure that you have any one. I mean, there's Mozy out there is a is a is a, comp a competing product that's wonderful. There is uh, there's a Carbonite, and there is uh, there is uh, this, what's the other one that's uh, escaping me now. But if you don't have a backup solution, this is really where I get to make the statement that you need to have a backup of all your backups. And this includes also backing up your own website on, on a regular basis. So many times you have a hosted solution for your website, you know, you have a web host, you go ahead and, uh, and, and uh, upload your website to your, to your website, or maybe you have a WordPress installation, and well, you never download the current one, and then it goes down, a web host has a problem, you know, you have a developer work on something, and they don't make an effective backup, and then your website's gone, and you no longer can uh, access it. So please make sure that you get a backup of things. Uh, this particular backup tool that we have on our website is just a, is just a tool that allows you to download a little application, and you can uh, you know, back up your, your particular client, Mac or PC. Uh, but you want to really make sure that you uh, have your backups effectively uh, set up and and uh, and they're working uh, for you. Okay, so uh, at this point, I want to make sure that I'm I'm staying within time. So I'm going to blaze through these, and then we'll answer any questions that we have. But I just have some very quick guidelines. I have seven guidelines for the cloud for small business, and so I'm going to go through these. One: determine your business needs first, then choose the cloud services. So many times, unlike what I just did before, with just telling you to dip your your toes in the water and lots of products, <laughs> my guidelines actually say to first really determine your business needs, look at all of the software, look at all of the operations of the business, and really see whether or not you're wasting time and energy or paying for services that you don't need to. 
you know, maybe that you have a, a point of sale system that is, uh, is you know, native operating system software with hardware and all the other trappings of that. Well, maybe you want to uh, push that to a cloud-based service. Maybe you want to get something like the Square. Maybe uh, get something like uh, into its uh, uh, payment portal, you know, payment go uh, go payment, I think it's called, and or you know one of the other products that might be out there. PayPal has their own as well. You know, you might decide on one of those things as opposed to having all of this infrastructure sitting around in your store and having to buy new equipment and so on and so forth. You know, these smaller products are capable of now doing all the, the uh, requirements of it. Pay attention also to the amount uh, point of sale system is charging you versus a Square or a PayPal or Intuit's uh, go payment platform. Uh, you might actually be saving money in the, uh, in the uh, individual transaction cost for your current system. But when you look at the overall cost and having to maintain that system and train staff and do all those other things, uh, it ends up being a huge waste. And, uh, and it also means that you can't take a payment necessarily on the road, and, and that might be where you might take most of your payments. And so you know, just, just look at all the, the, the various logistics of it and, and try to quantify those so that you're making the most, of, uh, the, the most of cloud services that you can. And where you can't, you can't. And where you don't, you don't. And don't worry about it. So uh, next up, uh, beware the lure of using uh, all of these software as a service products. So you'll, you'll see many, many different types of SaaS, and they become like candy. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll upgrade Evernote to a premium account, and I'll upgrade Dropbox to get extra space, and I'll get, a, and I'll get a, uh, the Google Drive uh, account, and I'll get the extra space on the Google Drive account, and I'll get Skype, and I'll get the Skype premium. And after you're done, you know, you're, you're spending now potentially hundreds of dollars per month, which, you know, in the aggregate over a year, ends up being a chunk of money. So just pay attention to uh, when you're using SaaS that, yes, each individual service is usually small, a small fee per month, but you don't own anything. You're just using it as a service, as a subscription. So pay attention to that reality that you are you're paying for a subscription and that on an annual basis, does that really make sense for you to have all of these premium services? So, so it, most of the time it doesn't. It usually means scaling down and only having a limited number of those and them doing everything you need. Make sure you understand the administrative and sharing rights associated with each of the products you're using. Many times you don't, and that creates phone calls to me. So uh, while I appreciate the phone calls, they're, they're usually very panicked and I, I want everyone to understand really what happens when they share something and who has access, just like the Dropbox story, you don't really want to be in a place where you get something deleted and so on and so forth. Uh, this one's just de facto, engage as many partners in the process when you're deciding on cloud. Really get your vendors, staff, clients, everybody on board as you're doing that so that you, you really hear everybody out. Next up, test and backup. Uh, test backup and restoration scenarios. So you never know when something's going to go wrong. You should really test the backup, uh, do a backup, and then literally try to restore that backup on a regular basis, maybe once every three months, once every six months, maybe once a year, depending upon your, your level of comfort with it. Next, have a plan for when you lose your connection to the cloud. The cloud requires you to be connected to the web. When you are not connected to the web, what happens? Your business can't shut down. You've got to continue working. So how, how are you going to have a plan for when you do lose connectivity? And there are really great ways in which you can do that. Uh, many services have, uh, have offline uh, access or offline abilities, and you should definitely take advantage of those. And then finally, I just want to leave you with being curious. Stay curious. Find new ways to use the cloud services for creation, collaboration, sharing, and storage. It's a, a, new, it's a new world order. We have all of these really great uh, you know, evolutions in technology, and we should be taking advantage of them as small business. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tracy. If, uh, if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer those, and then we can close out. Thanks, Ray. Um, I'm going to go ahead and close out, and people that want to stay around for questions, Ray will be here, but those of you that um, have other things going on, I want to be respectful of your time. So thank you all for participating today. Um, this webinar was archived, um, and it'll be posted on our website under live webinars and recordings about a week from now. 
you'll be receiving a follow-up email on the webinar with an evaluation in the, the, uh, the email. We ask you that you uh, complete that to help us to continue to improve our training. I've also pushed that link to you under the chat window, so you're welcome to fill that out right now. Um, Ray, thank you. I learned a lot today. As he said, there's always new technology out there, um, and so if you don't stay current with it, you're always learning something new. The, I think the software you were looking for backups, the other one out there is Cubby, um, besides those. Yes, yes. Um, that's the one we use at home. Um, so we do have several questions. So um, the first was on migrating to the cloud. Can slash how does your existing data, stored mail, docs on hard drives, get to the cloud so that all of your information is in one place? That's a great question. And so uh, when you want to do data synchronization, you should probably bring on a, a, a data consultant, an IT consultant, who would be able to make that, that conversion for you. Uh, some products allow you to be able to do that, uh, you know, with a with an easy conversion process. Uh, some some don't. Okay, so uh, you, you really do need to have someone on uh, that you engage for that process if you're not really aware or savvy of the of the of the data implications. One, you know, create a backup. Two, find out whether the 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 software built into it allows you to be able to, uh, you know, upload and synchronize that data. Uh, from out the gate. Uh, most of your email, maybe POP or IMAP, you know, those are two, two different types of protocols. And uh, so if you, if, you, if you have IMAP, that's really easy because you can just IMAP the, the, uh, the, the tool and suck all of your email in and suck all of your, your other files in the background in and you're pretty much, uh, your folder structure, all of that stuff goes in and you're pretty much good to go. If it's in a pop, then you're going to have to probably do some level of IMAP integration and then uh, sucking that data into uh, into the cloud somehow. So uh, it really it really depends on the product that you're using, but they're out there and just engage a, 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 you know your IT consultant to, to make that happen. It will be a good investment. I you know I, I don't think that there's any reason why you shouldn't uh, engage someone for that process uh, because it should be quick and easy uh, by outsourcing that little bit to them and making that happen. Kind of as a follow-up to that question was, do any of these tools have expert export capabilities in the event you wish to switch over from one product to another? Many of, many of them do, and uh, many of them are keeping your files, many of the ones that I talked about today are keeping your files in a native format. The only one I, I really talked about that wasn't creating, uh, actually the two that I, I, I talked about that weren't creating native file formats is really Evernote and then if you create Google Drive documents uh, in Google Drive, you've created it natively in the, in the Google Drive platform, it creates it in its own file format. However, it's easily exportable into any particular format. Google Drive actually gives you the ability to email it as a PDF, email it as, uh, if you use a Word document, you know, sort of a, a, a word processing document, you would be able to go ahead and, and send it as a, a Word, Microsoft Word document format, as a PDF, as, uh, you know, HTML, in several different formats. Uh, you can also download those as, as those formats as well. Evernote creates all of them in its own, not proprietary, but, but for lack of a better word, proprietary sort of format. And uh, there are, there are, ways to get things out of Evernote. Uh, it will export it. Uh, there's a tool called Everdump, a very, very funny name, but Everdump allows you to be able to go ahead and take your entire Evernote uh, account and uh, push it into a very large XML file. And uh, if you have a lot of stuff in Evernote, it's a large XML file. But it, it, it helps you go ahead and export that into a format that you can then go ahead and, and import into other services. So uh, most of them Otherwise, like Dropbox or, or Box or SugarSync, they're saving your files in a native format. But, so it's, it's, they're, they're your files. They're not being changed or manipulated in any way. So you're literally, you know, if you wanted to export, it's literally just taking the files that are in there and dragging and dropping it into the new service. And, uh, and I frequently do that for clients. You know, we're, we're just taking the files from one place and moving them into another. And it's just a matter of, one, make a local backup. Always back up, right? And then we'll just uh, highlight, copy, and then paste them into the new uh, services software. But one thing to pay attention to is that if you're going to use a service, make sure that they have an export functionality. 
I mean, it's, it's much less a question for me whether or not all of these services have uh, export functionalities, but that the one you use should, if that's something that's a criteria that you want. Especially if, you know, uh, one of these tech startups goes bust, you want to make sure that you're, you're prepared for the export of, of, the, of the technology. And if that's something important to you, then make sure that it's on your checklist. Well, Ray, that's all the questions that we have for today. So thank you again very much for everyone for attending. And Ray, thanks for um, your very insightful information on this topic. Thank you. Thank you. See you all in January.